Love listening to your favorite station? Start getting rewarded for the things you already do, like streaming your favorite radio station online. It's easy. Go to cbslocalrewards.com, sign up, and start earning points for listening to your favorite online CBS radio stations, reading articles, and viewing photo galleries on your local CBS website. Redeem your points for great prizes and gift cards from stores like Nike, Best Buy, and Amazon. Sign up today at cbslocalrewards.com. That's cbslocalrewards.com. This sports podcast on Play.it is powered by DraftKings, America's favorite fantasy sports site. A man who wears the 10 pounds of gold, the nature boy, Ric Flair. You know, I was like to take this opportunity to talk about myself. The 16-time heavyweight champion has arrived. I've got the star and profile like never before. The greatest talker in the history of the business is behind the mic. Again. You're talking to the roller-wearing, diamond ring-wearing, kiss-stealing, wheel-a-dealing, limousine like jet flying, son of a gun. This is Woo Nation with Ric Flair. I'm the man. Hi, this is Ric Flair, 16 times your world champion, hosting my show, Woo Nation, along with my good friend and co-host, Conrad Thompson, and our guest today, Conrad, the legendary Bret Hart. Bret, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much. The best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. And that's the last thing I saw said to you as I saw you. In San Jose, and I walked, I exited the room, and you had a line a mile long, longer than mine <laughs> this time, which really pissed me off. <laughs> well, it, it was a, in San Jose. The whole experience was a good experience. Yeah, I had a lot of fun great. there. It was great. Saw so you and your lovely wife. I met your son, who I still can't believe six four two forty is not in the business. Good for him. Yeah, yeah. Good for him. <laughs> Jeez. I shake my head too. No, but I'm saying it's this business right now. My daughter is up to her her eyes in it, as you know, right? But I mean, it's it's difficult out there right now. It's not like the kids are having a lot of fun like you and I had when we started. So, but yeah, anyway. it's a whole different thing now. Oh, totally different. Jeez. So, well, anyway, <clears throat> so the, my my fondest stories about Brett when he was young is <clears throat> his dad, Stu Hart had a legendary promotion in the Calgary, Canada. And, Stampede, uh, right? The Calgary Stampede, right. Um, well, that was the theme of one of their shows. Was the name of their promotion the Calgary Stampede? Yeah, it was Re- called Stampede Wrestling. That's Stampede called. Wrestling, okay. And so the legendary, as I broke into business with Vern Gagne, everybody talked about probably the two you know, most famous people training people to get into business were Stu Hart Stu with his dungeon, right? You know, which Brett probably hates the memories of, and Vern with his barn out in Minnesota in <laughs> very comparable weather, thirty below zero. So um, when I first won the NWA title, I went into Reno, and I met Stu for the first time. And Brett, you were there with your brothers, right? The first time I met you was in uh, Las uh, Las Vegas. Oh, Las Vegas. Okay, uh, one of the I, last, I should uh, read it. At, at the NWA convention, just before right? Before the big war. Yeah, the NWA one. I know Vern came through town. Yes, exactly. I remember okay. all the NWA guys running around saying that Vern Gagne was in the lobby or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know what that was. I know what he was there for. He slapped Bill Watts. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Did you ever hear that story? No. Yeah, Bill Watts was trying to steal the Oklahoma Territory from from Leroy McGurk and Vern. Not, and, I mean, and Vern took it as steel, and Vern flew out to Vegas, and he smacked Bill Watts. Wow. But that was Vern. I mean, Vern was like very much like your dad. He wasn't shy, right? Yeah, he was very, uh very direct kind of guy. Yeah. So, anyway, um, I can't do with the voice, but <laughs> he goes, <laughs> <laughs> Brett's dad, is, it, it's funny over the years, people like Shawn Michaels and that, they probably didn't know him nearly as well as I did. But he goes, eh, eh. So you're uh, Ric Flair, eh? <laughs> I, I hear you're a, a, a pretty fair hand. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> How do you answer that question? I think, I hope so. <laughs> How'd that sound, Brett? Was I close? 
That sounds uh, very close and sounds like a, uh, one of those kind of questions that my dad would ask. Oh, yeah. Uh, you have uh, a hard time so, uh, I hear you're a pretty fair hand. Are you? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the world champion. <laughs> I don't know what that means in Calgary, but down here. <laughs> so anyway, but his dad commanded like, the kind of respect that... Um, I mean, that, like, you know, he was the Vince McMahon, Vern Gagne, um, Fritz von Erich. I mean, that kind of respect. I mean, he was that highly thought of and, uh, in the NWA. And uh, um, not to take anything out of context, but one of the angles that I hated the most in your career, Brett, was the one you shot with Jerry Lawler when he was messing around with your mom and dad. <laughs> that got heat with me, and I'm one of the boys. <laughs> Do you remember that? I can remember Olin actually coming to me and saying that he thought that uh, that, it, that Lawler was going a little too strong. Oh, man, I'm watching that. that. I was getting pissed off, and it wasn't even my mom and dad. Because um, you, you were at the, was, that's when they were doing Raw at the old, uh, the little building downtown. Manhattan so. Center. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. sir. So, um, but, you I, know, the thing about that was, you know, when I remember coming home to actually talk to my mom and dad and see if it did kind of rile them up and... They loved it. They were laughing their heads off and uh, watching it back on the on the replay later well, that day on TV. And my mom almost just just loved it. I, I think just the whole humor of it. I think she got to kick out all the stuff Waller said about my dad. And, uh, you know, he put his false teeth in backwards and all that. All those yeah. jokes that Waller had. He well, was pretty funny, and I think somehow my mom got the humor. I remember looking at Owen and going, "We don't need to say anything to Jerry about this. Like, probably we were going to tell him to tone it down, but." You know, we got, once we got home and saw how much they liked it, we, you know, we never had a problem with it. Yeah, I know. It's funny because as you get older, and trust me, I, I know that feeling. You, we'll do just about anything to be part of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Especially me. They can beat me up, throw me around, roll me in a ball. I don't care. <laughs> just give me some time on Raw. <laughs> so I can sit next to Brett and sign autographs next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, um, Conrad's got a whole pile of stuff for you, and you've met Conrad twice with me at the last two WrestleManias. He's a huge fan, and he probably knows more about the business than Melter. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, that's say that's that. a pretty bold statement. That's a big pair <laughs> of shoes to fill. I do want to ask though, Brett, back when you were first starting with Stampede, how hard was it to be the promoter's son? I mean, that had to be just a totally different dynamic from, you know, being in the locker room with the boys and the eyes of the fans, you know, just being who your dad was. How difficult was that for you? Well, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I think it could have been difficult for me, but uh, I think right from the, the, the time that I got in working for my dad, I think I was... I was sort of sorely needed as one of his better workers, even when I first started. And I think um, I always thought the way the wrestlers treated me, they always had a lot of respect for for my work rate and uh, you know my uh, sort of whole approach to the business. You know, back in those days, if I was driving the van or if I was um, picking up the money for the towns or whatever it was, I know that. Most, I think all the rest just thought I was pretty reliable and pretty, um, you know, always reasonable and never asked anyone to do anything I wouldn't do myself kind of thing. And, uh, you know, so I had, I kind of had a nice respect going into the business and, uh, you know, I refereed for a little while and I think I started to learn the business, but I always uh, felt that it was kind of a mixed, mixed bag of nuts, the whole thing of being a promoter's kid. In some ways it had lots of uh, benefits and you, you were treated, um, a little better or that you were at least uh, connected or you were important. So, you know, any promoter's kid usually got treated with respect. But on the other hand, you also had to earn it. And, you know, a lot of promoter's kids did earn it. And I always heard Greg Gagne was a hard worker and a decent worker and stuff like that. And I know that certain promoter's kids were decent workers. And then there was other promoter's kids that uh, kind of dropped the ball and, uh, and kind of made all promoter's kids look bad. And, uh, you know, I don't need to say who they were, but there was just different pr promoters that you had respect for and ones that, as far as the kids went, you didn't. We'll be right back with the limousine riding, jet flying, kids stealing, wheeling the son of a gun, and one Rick Flair. Woo! On Woo Nation. The wait is finally over. Baseball season is here at last. And the excitement continues all season long at DraftKings.com, the official daily fantasy partner of Major League Baseball. 
Daily Fantasy means no season-long commitments, just instant cash, instant gratification. Why wait until the end of the season to claim victory when you can win huge cash every day? At DraftKings, it's like a brand new season every time you play. Just select two pitchers, eight position players, stay under the salary cap, and you could be on your way to an enormous payday. Last year, Peter from Colorado won a million bucks at DraftKings in one day just playing fantasy baseball. Hundreds of thousands of fantasy sports fans just like you have already called in at DraftKings. Now it's your turn. Woo! Heard at DraftKings.com now. Use promo code FLAIR to play for free. You could win part of the $300 million in prizes being awarded this season. Use promo code F-L-A-I-R, Flair, for free entry now at DraftKings.com. DraftKings.com, that's DraftKings.com. Woo! The greatest talker in the history of the business is behind the mic once again. This is Woo Nation with Ric Flair. We're listening to uh, Bret Hart here on Woo Nation, here from Play.it. You can check out Bret Hart online at brethart.com or on Twitter at Bret Hart is where you can find him. Uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you today, Brett, was regarding the match that was finally released just a couple years ago on DVD between yourself and Tiger Mask. It seemed like that one was one that longtime fans had wanted to see forever and ever, and finally the WWE put it out there. And I guess this is a question for, for you too, Rick. How difficult was it calling a match with a language barrier where you speak English, he speaks Japanese, and somehow you guys are supposed to put on a hell of a match? How difficult was that, and what were your philosophies in, in pulling that off? Well, for me, most of the Japanese guys I ever worked with, they're almost taught in Japan all the English names for everything. So, you know, they can't speak English, but they can call a match. Like they can, they know what a drop kick is, and they know what a, they know all the words for all the moves. So, you know, the language barrier wasn't such a problem. It wasn't just in, you know, maybe, you know, most of the time when you had a, if there was a screw up or a mistake, you certainly could communicate very well because they didn't speak. Any English other than wrestling moves. Yeah, I, I'd agree. You know, they just were tough kids. I mean, um, I, I'm sure Brett will agree with you. They, <clears throat> we train hard here. We did. I mean, Brett and I, you know, started at a time when it was tough to get in this business, and we started for promotions that were hard on you. And I heard Stu stretched everybody, as did Vern and Billy Robinson and the guys that I broke in with. But those Japanese kids are tougher than hell. I mean, they were back then, right, Brett? And uh, they were always super, super fit. Yeah, super, super And well schooled in wrestling. Like, they all knew how to shoot a double leg takedown and basic wrestling. They were all pretty skilled. Yeah, and, and, and they're not afraid of anything. So, and, and, and they, they know the way to get over <clears throat> is to beat and recognize uh, or to have a good match or whatever the word would be uh, with a recognized American star. So, um, I, I like going to Japan, but I didn't like working with some of the guys. I had, I mean, I couldn't do anything with Jumbo Saruta. And Tenru was great. I loved him, and I loved uh, Choshu and uh, some of those guys. Um, but, and of course, I loved wrestling with Muda and Fujinami, who I inducted this year. But some of the guys, man, I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't handle. And they didn't think I was tough enough, so they didn't care. But that's why they sent Harley over a couple of times as my bodyguard to make sure <laughs> to make sure they didn't swap the title. <laughs> well, speak, speaking of swapping titles, Brett, you won your first world title from our host, of course, Rick Flair, and it was actually taped for a Coliseum home video release uh, filmed in October of '92. When did you guys know about this, and kind of when was the plan, and how did you guys find out? Well, um, for me, it was all. Um, it was, it was all one day. I didn't find anything out until the morning of the show that earlier that day, I got told to fly to Saskatoon and meet Vince McMahon at, uh, I think it was eight in the morning. Yeah. And, uh, I was, I had changed my airplane ticket flying from, from England, which was a, a big no, no or something at the time. So I thought I was getting, going to get sh trouble. I thought I was in trouble. Chief Jay, uh, who told me the night before, uh, that 
they had changed my flight, and I was on the first flight in the morning to Saskatoon, and Vince wanted to see me straight at the building, straight away, and the first thing in the morning. I had no idea. I really should have known or could have known, but I, I'd even heard something a few weeks before about this. they were looking to put the belt on somebody, and I never thought about it that morning. I remember kind of flying there, kind of scared that I was going to get fined or something like that. Uh, it was quite strange to actually sit outside I sat at the end of a long hallway and uh, when I got there they said Vince is in there with Rick and so I went and sat there was only one chair and I remember it was way way far at the other end of the hall and uh, I sat down and waited for Rick to come out and Rick came out shook Vince's hand and uh, they had a good sort of goodbye or whatever and he let, walked down the hall but he went the other way and so I never did see Rick he he went out the the other way out, and then Vince looked down the hall and called me down. And like I said, I thought, uh, and the way Vince told me was, he sort of made out like, uh, you know, how long I've been there, and they how many belts have they put on me already, and they had done everything they could do with me, and, uh, and then he just it was just about to, my mind to tell me that I was it was time to let me go. I remember actually sitting there thinking that Vince was going to fire me that day for some reason. And that my dad was supposed to be flying in to uh, be my in my corner that night, and I was going, I don't know how am I explain to him that uh, there's no, you know, I was kind of just concerned about the whole thing. And then Vince, I remember, just just looked at me and said, "So we're going to put the big belt on you tonight." And I never said a word to him. And I remember he he looked at me and said, "You should really smile or clap or something." Or I've never seen anyone with no expression. <laughs> and I remember I just and I said, "I'm just not sure whether I even believe it." Yeah, you know, because like, they they'd said some of the things to me over the over the years that never ever happened. You know, it was like I still think if they'd said to me, um, you know, if so they'd announced to the dressing room in, in June that they were going to put the belt on me, and at the same time, um, they would have changed their mind by the time they got to that day. If they'd had more time to think about it, but it was so quick and so sudden. You know, um, I, I always. Uh, you know, remember being my favorite day in the business. Was that your, was that your, would you call that your favorite day in the business? Yeah, I think that was the, the, uh, the biggest uh, stunned shock. Uh, you know, I couldn't believe it. I didn't believe it till it happened. Yeah. Well, for Until me... Until I actually had the belt in my hand and, and was, <laughs> was the champion. It was like, I couldn't believe it was going to happen, was happening. It was all too surreal for me. Yeah, well, what what happened? I Brett knows this now. Is I was wrestling the Ultimate Warrior on Friday night, and Charles Barkley had come to see me in Phoenix, and the Warrior suplexed me and dropped me on my head, and I got that I had that inner ear problem, and I already was told that they were going to make Brett the champion, but it was like at a different time, right? But I had that inner ear problem, and I couldn't work the next day, and then they called me and said, uh, "You're going to." To drop it to bread on Monday night, and I said, "Well, I can hardly stand up because I could take I could take a bump, but I couldn't get up fast." I see. Because my equilibrium, I, in other words, if I went down flat, when I got up for about eight, set, maybe ten seconds, I, I was dizzy. Right. So, as a matter of fact, I thought it was something wrong with me, like I was gonna, like I had some kind of a neurological problem, but it was an inner ear problem. So, I got there, and uh, you know, I was. I'd already heard that I was going to drop it to Brett, but I wish it had been for me. I told Brett this 10 times. I wish it had been when I could work better because I, I just couldn't get up. Better. He could give me his moves, but I couldn't get up and feed fast enough. Sure. Or whatever the occasion called for. But um, anyway, when it got better, <clears throat> as a result of me, not, it did get better. The day I was supposed to get my Lloyd's of London money, Brett, you don't know this. After three months, the day I was supposed to get my Lloyd's of London money, I woke up and it was fixed. <laughs> I, went over, I went over and hit my head against the wall three times <laughs> and said, what in the hell? I'm flying to Minneapolis to get the money, to go, to, you know, the 500 grand or whatever it is, 750, right? And everybody else got all this money over, you know, half the guys faked the injuries, right? And I'm going to get my money, and, and I woke up, I hit my head against the wall three times. I was in Louisville, Kentucky. I said, I can't believe this. I'm fine. I called my dad. I said, Dad, I'm going to say I'm so dizzy. He said, no, you're not. It's karma. I said, yeah, I'm still right. I am. I'm dizzy. I want that damn money. I was paying $35,000 a year premium for that stuff, you know, so that's that's my memory of it. But I remember, I thought we had some really good matches afterwards, but that, the night I gave it to him, it was no... So you were disappointed in the match that night, though? Oh, I, I, I couldn't pull off my end. 
you know, Brett was probably so excited he didn't notice it, but I, I couldn't pull off my end, you know what I mean? Right. So I couldn't do my upside down. <laughs> I thought we had a lot of fun afterwards, but I, I certainly could have given you a better match that night, but, you know, it didn't matter. You know, if, if, at, that, at some point in your life, if you're having fun with the guy you're working with, you'd rather do that than anything. I mean, and finally, I mean, this guy, you know, Brett, technician, in great shape, cares about the business. I mean, you know, it, 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 was, it was fun for me. So I have fond memories of it, and I certainly don't regret the night, that's for sure. I, uh, you know, I always had especially fond memories of just prior to winning the belt. We had such uh, good matches in uh, Germany. I remember we stole a show every night in Germany, left them just, just going crazy. We were walking out back to the dressing room, the place was just going crazy. And, yeah, uh, no, and we stole I remember I mean, all those days. Every show I ever worked in Germany was sold out. But those ones just before I won the title were really special nights. Wait, 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 that was you and me, right? Yeah, everywhere. We yeah. worked. I think every other night I worked with Papa Shango. Yeah. Who was, but I had really good matches with like two different kind of style matches. And really, the fans would go to all different shows. And yeah. It worked out really well for me. I had really good matches with you. And I just remember you always got me over really strong. And you were always walking back to dressing with the belt. Kind of just barely, like you survived a, a really tough match. And I just remember the German fans just, just clapping and cheering like they got the great. Well, it was, a, it was a great feeling just before yeah. I won the match. Well, you know, I mean, I don't think I've told 10 people this, or anything. Conrad knows this, but we're at SummerSlam in London, and I just knew Brett a little bit. You know, we always got along great, but I didn't know him that well, right? right. And I'm this, I'm there managing uh, Henning, I think, it's something to do with, with Randy Savage, and he wrestles Davy Boy, right? And I'd never seen this, but I, I put it into my routine right away with guys I could trust, Brett being one of them. Brett gives Davy Boy this superplex off the top rope. Right. So I go back to the hotel, and I knock on Bret Hart's door. I said, I said, if I'd known you could work like that, you son of a bitch, I'd be kissing your ass a long time ago. <laughs> I never, I mean, I didn't know you could work like that. Because I always saw you in tag uh, matches. Do you remember I don't that? Do you remember who was with you? You Macho Man was with you. No, Macho. macho man, yeah, I mean, I, was, I go, I go. that son of a bitch can really work. Holy shit. I mean, you you and Davey Boy, and not just because it was London. I don't give a shit if someone's going to say it was Davey Boy's home country. That match, nothing followed it the rest of the night. It was nothing. the main event. Was it the main yeah, event? Yeah, that was the last one. Oh, I thought the Warrior and Savage was the that main event. That was actually event. I was going to say, the Warrior and Savage didn't, die, whatever no, we were. Couldn't hold Thank God we were around before that. Jesus Christ. But that was unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, so well, that's I a couple times. I remember when I was in uh, Baltimore the day after when we got back because we had TVs or something like that. But, uh, I remember you and Macho Man watched it on closed circuit in the hotel room. Yeah. And you came and found me at my room. And well, that's what it was. Yeah, okay. Shook my, it shook my hand, both of you, and said that, that was the greatest match you ever watched. And you, you both wanted, just wanted to come shake my hand for putting on such yeah, a Yeah, no, match, it was you know? unreal. I, did, I guess it was. I was trying to think. Um, we were having a pretty good party at the Holiday Inn after SummerSlam, so... I probably was thought yeah. you had to get a draw from Arnie to get out of the place. <laughs> <laughs> that Brett can vouch for. I didn't miss anything in the nightlife over there. <laughs> can you imagine taking the crew to London for seven days now for a show? <laughs> yeah. We, we lost, we lost uh, Mike Hagstrand on that tour and uh, what was the kid's, the other kid's name from Minneapolis? Um, John oh. Nord. <laughs> John and Mike Hagstrand just departed the company yeah, they, voluntarily. <laughs> It didn't come yeah, home. They, they quit completely and just moved, stayed there for about three months. I know. The road warriors were no more. I, t- I saw Joe, and I tell Joe that's one of the greatest stories. I said, where's Mike? And he, he just got in his motorcycle and kept riding. <laughs> 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 what are you, you going to say about that? I mean, oh, God, I left there. I, my, I, my credit card has bounced a lot of times over the years, but not as high as it bounced in the lobby that holiday in when I was leaving. <laughs> I, I called Arnold Skoll and I said, Arnie, I need a draw, man, now, major. <laughs> and could I have 500 more to get home on? <laughs> Who's got a $3,000 bar tab in 1991? <laughs> Rick Seven Flair. Days. Yeah, I know. That's it. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> We're talking with Brett the Hitman Hart here on Woo Nation right here at Play.it. And uh, I want to talk to you guys about WrestleMania 8 from Indianapolis. At the time, blood was banned in the WWF, and two guys bled that night, and it was Bret Hart and Ric Flair. But I think only one of you got in trouble. What was the story there, Brett, as you remember it? 
He wrestled Roddy Piper there. That's right. Um, all, all I can say about that, I think, is that it was just a matter of uh, placement on the card, probably. You know, we just have, I don't think anyone talked about it. I think it was something uh, we kept pretty close vest about it uh, in our match. And I think that Randy and Rick did the same. It was just uh, we were out there first. That's all, all it really is to that. Yeah, for me, I mean, I, I, he, I didn't get in trouble, but he just pulled me into the side and because Macho, you know, said, you get some juice from me. I said, yeah, I mean, what the hell, you know? It's Randy Savage. I don't care. Right. And, and nobody said don't, so it isn't like, but I didn't ask. And I'm, I'm walking down the hall, you know, thinking I had a pretty good match with Randy. And, you know, as you know, Brett, at that time, the tension with Randy and Liz was at all-time high. That was, that was one of the hardest weeks I've ever been through because I had to go to Tampa and practice, and I'm not used to doing that, and practice all week long. And, you know, Randy had to have it written down and scripted, you know, which was okay, but he and Liz were bar- barely talking to that. As a matter of fact, that's the last time they performed together. And so I thought we had a pretty good match. It was far from great, but it was a pretty good match. And uh, I'm walking down the hall, and Vince <laughs> Patterson came and got me, and said, Vince, I want to talk to you. And I thought he was going to say, good job, man. You know, sorry for all the tension. <laughs> he looked at me and said... Every time, every time you get this close to greatness, you do something to screw it up. And I said, "What did I tell you?" I said, "Who told you to get? Who, who told you to cut yourself?" And I said, "I don't know. I just did it on my own." He said, "Well, that's what I'm talking about. You don't do that without letting me know." <laughs> not, not thank you. Nothing. Wow. <laughs> see you. See you when I see you, Rick. TV tomorrow. Don't be late. <laughs> that was <Wow>. it. <laughs> that was kind of the. Well, I kind of knew that was that was that was what it was. So, you know, I did my best anyway to to make it look like an accident. And for I think for the most part, I think they they believe me. And uh, I think even they watch it back to weren't sure what whether it happened or not or what happened. Yeah, uh, I I don't know. I I always. Uh, my I, my my memory of it was that maybe it was just bullshit at the time. Was that, that Rick and Randy got fined for it, and me and uh, Roddy they never said a word to us about it. No, I I didn't get fined. I just he just you know he know he knows how to get to me by saying something that hurts my feelings. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I the fine would be nothing to me, but he could. Vince has got a way of you know because he's such a. And as you know, Brett, he he anything that Vince McMahon asks you to do, pretty much he'll do himself, and uh, he lives by that. And he, um, he, you know, he to me he's always been very fair, but he wants the heads up, you know. And I can remember he's not shy about telling him. And you know, I came out of the ring one night, and he goes, "80s heels don't draw anymore. What are you doing?" <laughs> You know, this is like, this is in 2003, <laughs> talking about me being an 80s heel. I don't know. What, what do you mean? <laughs> What's changed in time here? <laughs> so, you know, to kind of be a good guy and a bad guy. But he'll he just go he just go off on me for one, you know. And another time he said, where'd you learn that slam off a top rope? And I said, from Harley Race. He said, I'll oh, just get out of my office now. <laughs> and Brett calls it the Beal off the top rope. <laughs> Brett says, why do you take a Beal all the time? I said, I don't take a Beal. He said, yeah, you do off the top rope. Well, I, I, I called it a slam. Brett called it a Beal. I didn't know what he was talking about. Oh, man, we've had so much fun. Uh <laughs> We've got the greatest in here right now. We've got Brett the Hitman Hart on the line with us here on Woo Nation at Play.it. And I guess we should just go ahead and address the elephant in the room. In years past, Brett, you've been critical of some of Rick's matches, and I realize everybody's getting along these days, so I don't really want to stir it up, so to speak. But how do you think you guys' philosophies differ towards wrestling or what makes a good match, and how did you guys just see things differently through the years? And you well, can you know, say what you can say whatever you want to say. We'll still be text Rick buddies. Is, is a little bit taken out of context. I think a little bit. Mm-hmm. What I would say is that, uh, that we just have sort of just overlapping errors. You know, his error and my error just are very close. I mean, I was a guy that, like he said, when he was talking about Randy. You know, I could always go in the ring and call a match out there. I didn't need to even plan anything. 
like zero. I'd go out and do an hour match with Rick. I don't think was ever talking without ever talking to him before we went out. <clears throat> and I could do that with Rick um, at any given time. At the same time, I was also part of the Dynamite Kid and a different generation that was going a lot faster and doing a lot more uh, sort of intricate uh, new high spots that weren't sort of the same ones that because there was a period of time. You know, through the Dory Funk era and even the Harley era, a lot of guys just worked like them. A lot of them, people that just took the same bumps, the same style, that basically had the same match Harley had before he went out. And that was just a style that everyone picked up. It was a good, safe style, but it was, when I thought when, in, say, in the, um, you know, the 80s, early 80s, that um, in Calgary, that we started being a little more creative with. Um, actual working where it was a little stiffer a little more believable dynamite was a uh, incredible uh wrestler that in long before he ever got to wwe the stuff he was doing here in calgary was uh you know ahead of its time and uh so i learned from some good guys a, a little more of a different style which i think you know I, I didn't have the pleasure of working with just american wrestlers like uh, say rick worked with a lot of american guys you know the best workers in the states where i you know, worked with guys in England and worked with Japanese guys and Puerto Ricans and a lot of different styles and stuff like that. And uh, I just think that when when my time came, after Rick's time was sort of still wrestling, um, the, you know, the the way they they call it in there, they figure it out on the fly, and that's what makes the that's the genius of of those days. And I knew that from you know Harley, and I worked just. I actually started as that era was changing a little bit. And I think, um, I don't know, maybe I was a pioneer or something with uh, Dynamite and some of these guys that started taking wrestling in a, in a little bit of a different direction and picking up the speed. And, uh, you know, I always say that when the Bulldogs came to the WWE, for example, in, uh, in 84, I think it was 85, you know, everybody started working harder. And that's just the way the style changed. And I think the business got better after that. I think it just was the natural, you know, path that the wrestling was going to take, and the wrestling kind of upped a little bit after uh, in the '80s. And I'm sure Rich got his own thoughts on it. Yeah, no, I I agree. I'm the first to admit when you wrestle an hour every night, which I did for ten right. years, you know, you get into a routine, you know, and you hope that the guy you're working with is just a little bit over. Because sometimes if it's not, <laughs> it could be a long hour. Well, in fairness, too, a lot of that, when you were doing those hour matches, weren't on cable every week. So it's not like the same people are seeing the same match every week. No, but you do it in Greensboro. The, the, boys, are, the boys are seeing it. Right, I, right. And I think that uh, I'm the first to admit. But, but you know, I didn't, I didn't have the blessing of a, a Ricky Steamboat or a Barry Windham every night. You know what I mean? And Harley, even Harley, Harley would let me lead the match. But I wrestled Harley's match. Dory would let me lead the match, you know, after a while, but I wrestled Dory's match. Terry Funk, I, you know, he'd let me lead after a while when he was comfortable, but I wrestled Terry's match. Terry, of course, became so innovative in his own style. I mean, you know, I, I bet you feel the same way, Brett. Terry Funk and Dick Murdoch were way ahead of their time, man, where they could be yeah. such, such serious techni technical guys. But Murdoch could make people laugh, too, way before anybody else could. I mean, he'd take a bump over the top rope in St. Louis when nobody was doing anything and walk into the turnbuckle and knock himself out. I mean, <laughs> no, no, nobody did that. I <laughs> think in Murdoch, at the same time, Murdoch could get in the ring, and it, technically, there weren't too many guys as, as good as Dick Murdoch. Would you agree, Brett? Oh, he was uh, he was a real pro. He oh, was, uh, Jesus. He was one of those kind of guys that you'd love... You loved him in the ring, and you loved him, loved him out of the ring. He was a hilarious character outside the ring. Oh, he's tremendous very, to very be with. Very funny, had a dry sense of humor. Uh, yeah, sarcastic. He was a very funny. He, you you could have um, followed him around all day and always had a laugh. With yeah, him. I did <laughs> for three years. Then I got rid of him when he came to the Carolinas, <laughs> the, the redneck. <laughs> but he was uh, God. I tell you. Um, Murdoch, I mean, he had his style too, but he, everything he did from the stomp, you know, turning your face sideways and stomping you in the head 
to his punches. Everything he did looked phenomenal. I mean, you can't pick apart any of his stuff. And uh, but at the same time, he do a can... knee drop off the top rope that looks unbelievable. Exactly, and he's one of the few guys you take... He's one of the few guys you take it from too. Him and Ray. <laughs> yeah, you don't even have to move. You, know, no. you just know that he was always a safe. And safety was always uh, mm-hmm. Dick Murdoch's uh, priority. You never, I don't remember him ever being even stiff, but just no. a, a super player to work with every night. Yeah, no, and and the thing too is that if you think about it, um, this is a guy that ne- he was like Ray Stevens. He never went to the gym. Never right. worked out. I mean, Harley never went to the gym. Never worked out. I mean, these guys. You know, where Brett and I are in this added this era where. Cosmetics are everything. I mean, you know, we're, we're you know, you know, I'm wrestling Kerry Von Eric one night, Steamboat the next. I mean, help me out, right? Right. Then along comes Luger, right? And, and all the Von Eric boys, you know, with the exception of David, were built, you know, like crazy. And then got Luger, and then here comes the Road Warriors. I mean, the cosmetic thing kind of turned it around for all of us. You know, I mean, you, you have to admit, Brett. I mean, you, you, you and I, you more so than me, but you know, we were not exactly. The cosmetic poster boys that some of these guys no. were. They, that Kerry Von Erich just, you know, he, he was, um, you know, the most phenomenally genetically gifted guy I think I've ever seen. His genetics were phenomenal. I'm sure he had some help along the way, but <laughs> it <just> didn't matter. <laughs> he looked like a million bucks. And then, then Luger and then Steamboat. And I mean, a lot of the guys just had great physiques. You know, so if you could work, you know, we, we try to, I think Brett, I'm speaking for Brett and I, we we counted on our work and our entertainment, I mean, on our work our work rate, probably more than our look to, to be successful in the business. Well, I, my, my, my strongest suit was always my work rate, you know, not how good I worked, but, you know, and when I first started, I was, um, you know, I always had a lot of trouble um, um, doing promos and trying to do trying to be a baby face or find my way as a baby face. And, you know, I always keep people will, you know, talk about my, my, my capabilities as a, as a promo guy, but it was always hard to, to do promos and not have any confidence. Like when you sort of knew you were just going to go out and do a job for somebody, especially, um, you know, when I first got to WWE, it was kind of, I was just a stepping stone from being like a regular jobber that, you know, just started doing jobs for everybody. And it was like, I was fighting my hardest not to get into that category. And then, you know, it was, um, it was like here, do promos. When I got turned baby face, I was under the impression they were going to give me this big push. And, uh, so I was sort of, uh, semi cautious with my promos in the beginning. And then right away I found out I was like basically doing jobs for bad news and getting him ready for Hogan. And, uh, so I kind of came out of the who, starting right? day as a baby face and, and uh, Bad News Brown or Bad News Allen, remember him? Oh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. I, I never met him, but I know, yeah. I know the name. They turned me baby face in the story, in an angle with him at the WrestleMania or whatever, but anyway, they just, you know, when they, it's in order to have good promos, you gotta, you gotta feel some kind of confidence or sort of faith that they're gonna give you a little push, and I found that every time I got into that sort of situation where... I could start speaking with a little more confidence in my promos. They automatically started beating me, and I kind of lost all that confidence and realized that I was just a stepping stone for somebody else to make money. And, uh, you know, so you kind of went through that phase all the time until suddenly one day, you know, they sort of give you a, give you the real push, which was probably the, was the Intercontinental Belt, and you start getting a real push. And then you start going out there with confidence and talking for your promos, and they start going, oh, he's finally starting to learn how to do promos. I think it's a little bit, uh, you know, you do the best you can with what you got. Well, and then you get a chance to help others, you know, come up to that next level. And you certainly did that after a break in 96 when you came back and you asked to work with Steve Austin, and that really helped him move up a level. What did you see in him to make you want to work with him on your comeback? You know, I when I um, first saw Steve, he was in uh, WCW, and uh, I, I liked his work. I liked his look, and I thought this is the kind of guy that I could, uh, if I worked with him, I could make him look good. Like I give him a really good match. I could just see it the way he worked that I would, I would mix well with him, our styles. And uh, I remember trying to talk Vince into bringing him in, and I, especially after I heard, I heard somewhere that he was in ECW, and I remember telling Vince that 
they should try to get him in if he's that available. And next thing you know, he was in the dressing room walking around, and it was like he, somebody had called him, and you know, like that he was back, he was in WWE. And uh, I was with Steve, a guy worked with him in the beginning when he first got there, and I think, um, you know, I guess at that time I'd already. Um, they worked with Rick, and I had a lot of. I started to have a lot of uh, really good matches under my belt. Where right? I was pretty, pretty good out there with my my psychology and stuff. And uh, and I'm, I I found that when I worked with Steve um, in the beginning, anyway, he was a little bit erratic and a little bit. Sometimes he just kind of lose control out there, you know, where he just started going so fast, kind of like a windmill, where he didn't know what to do next, and he was he'd forget everything you planned out or talked about. And just kind of just make a left turn and get lost, kind of thing. And you'd have to kind of swing around, and get him back on track, and get him right back into. And, the, and I found that uh, he started to trust me over time to kind of you know teach him how to how to not to panic in the match. Because sometimes he just kind of panic and just start going crazy, you know. And uh, I think I helped uh, kind of calm Steve down and. <laughs> make him uh, sort of just relax and play his character and focus on the match. And just, it was like, so a lot of times with Steve was just great acting. Yeah. You know, well, he said the stuff Brett, looked really, <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you think it might've been the five rip fuels he drinks a day. <laughs> 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 Jesus. I, I own 10 gold gyms and I couldn't have kept Steve <laughs> in, in rip fuel. Like, you know, I drink in the coffee like crazy. I didn't know Riff Fuel. I used to, when when my son Reed was amateur wrestling, right, and I saw these kids in Oklahoma be running around the mat. I mean, like they were like they were, you know, what on an Adderall or something, right? And so I figured out that I started getting his amino uh, drink, right, and putting Riff Fuel in it to, to compete <laughs> with the twelve year olds. <laughs> But I drink a Rip Fuel, man, and I, I'm walking around until, you know, 3 a.m. the next afternoon. And, and Steve, man, Steve can drink that Rip Fuel. Nobody can stand in the corner and kick somebody 100 times in the stomach <laughs> <laughs> and not be out of breath, but, except for Steve Austin. Jesus. I love it. Uh, but I can see where I, I, I love working with Steve, too. But, man, he, he doesn't get tired. and he, I mean, he trains. Steve trains very hard. Sure. But that Rip Fuel, man, <laughs> Jesus. So. Uh, I always I uh, loved the matches I had with Steve. I always thought he was uh, I always thought he was a talented worker, and uh, and especially uh, as he became you know got away from the stunning you know Steve Austin thing and becoming more stone cold. Yeah. Even in that uh, transition, he was still a lot of fun to work with, and uh, you know I, I actually really enjoyed working with Steve right from the start, and uh, I think um, the match we had at uh, WrestleMania 13 was. Um, Amazing. Still one of my favorite matches ever to watch Is back. If I ever sit back and watch What's a match back, I would love to watch it with Steve. We have a lot of memories from that match. There's a lot of little funny little, not even funny, but just really intricate little moments for that match. It was, it was a brilliant match, I think. It was in March of 97 in Chicago. Uh -huh. Listen, I quit. Ken Shamrock was the referee. Oh, okay. Austin bled out. Probably the best WrestleMania match at that time. Yeah. I mean, to me, it was it was the best WrestleMania what, no, match. 1986? 1997. 97, I was going to say. 86. Yes, Jeez, Brett was 14 years old. <laughs> <laughs> All the ladies love Slick Rick. You know they love Woo Nation. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Do you love listening to your favorite podcasts on Play.it? Sign up today for the Play.it newsletter to receive monthly updates on new podcasts, notable guests, trending shows, and more. Sign up now at PlayItNewsletter.com. That's PlayItNewsletter.com. Hear what you've been missing. The greatest talker in the history of the business is behind the mic once again. This is Woo Nation with Ric Flair. Brett, earlier this year, Bischoff did an interview where he said that you offered to bring the WWF belt to Nitro with you, but all we've ever heard from you is that you would drop the belt you know, on Raw the night after Survivor Series. Is Bischoff lying, or did you offer to bring the belt? No, that's not true. I mean, to be really honest, it just doesn't really make any sense. 
I lost the belt to Sean. I didn't have a belt. Uh, I, th- I think he's saying in the negotiations when you were first, you know, nah. making contact with him about coming back. No, nah, I don't. But he, if it was brought up, it wasn't brought up by me. Right. You know, it was not anything I would have done ever. It was not something that I would have ever. Like I, I was hoping to leave the company on good terms and maybe even come back when I was done with WCW. I, I didn't even want to leave. If anything, I was playing. I was thinking more that I wouldn't would end up staying there. To be honest, I only made the decision to go with the uh, with Bischoff and those guys at the at the very end, at the last minute when I had nowhere else to cut the turn. When Vince kind of basically. You know, gave me no option but to sign off. I think he was trying to get me out by then. And, uh, so there's no, I didn't have a belt to do it with, and uh, it's just not something that I would have um, volunteered because it's not something I would have done. But, uh, you know, uh, Eric, um, he was having a pretty fuzzy memory with all that stuff anyway. Yeah, well, don't, hey, don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I tell the story. Well, I got a vivid memory of those the WCW guys. They were so fucked up. Oh, Brett. <laughs> hey, 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 now, here's the rib on me, right? So I know Brett's coming down, right? And I don't have a position, but I know Brett's coming. I, I'll tell you what. I was in Buffalo, New York with Bischoff, and I said, let me work with Bret Hart. He goes, uh, well, what do, what do you think? I said, me, I promise you, I'll, me and Bret Hart. I did, you know, right. He said, you got a problem beat you? I said, Eric. You're having, what's the guy? What was, what was the Mexican guy? Conan beat me last week, okay? <laughs> yeah, Bret Hart can beat me, no problem. <laughs> so we go to Dayton, Ohio, and it's me and Bret, right, in pay-per-view. The main event is Savage and Nash. And Bret and I went in that ring in Dayton, Ohio, man, and they, they're still standing there, man. And we, they kept saying, go home. And they, we, they you know, when Bret put the sharpshooter on me, I had to figure four. He superplexed me off the top rope. I mean... There was nothing left. There was nothing left for them, right? And right. Brett and I go walking through the curtains, and the Grandy Savage, God rest his soul, he was screaming at me, and I, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't say shit to Brett. God damn it, you went too long. What are you talking about? You left me in Nash now. <laughs> right. I started laughing to myself. I went back to the Marriott and had another drink. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you remember that, Brett? He was out of his yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do remember having a, a really good match for the end. Oh God, it was like, and we didn't. Even, we just did a little deal. I walked out. We were in St. Louis of all places, and Brett's out there, and I, I walk up to him. You know, I, I could always make Brett laugh in the ring, and I go, "So listen, kid, while you in Calgary training, I said I was in, uh, what did I say, Singapore? No, in Singapore, wrestling Brody, and the natives were restless, and Brett started laughing." <laughs> I play back some of our YouTube stuff, man. It was worth that. It, we had to get paid for this stuff, Brett. I should look at him and say, well, you were in the Calgary training in the dungeon. I was in Singapore wrestling Brody, and the natives were restless, and Brett started laughing. <laughs> Not too much heat going uh, on there, but uh, we had just had there's fun. one interview where we did, uh, I don't know, I got a brown T-shirt on, and, and you're in there, I remember you end up popping a bunch of elbows on your jacket and all that. I remember just I, it was a it was a classic. I saw it on YouTube. My wife played it for me a few months ago. It made me laugh. It made me burst out laughing at how uh, I know. it was a hilarious uh, of both of us uh, in our prime sort of uh, yeah. Well, God, playing you know. along with our characters and stuff and having a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I go to them and say that little thing they say. You know, like yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> that's how it started. He goes, you know, that little rhyme you have. I mean, you know, something. <laughs> that was. We just had great chemistry. We Absolutely. didn't. Re- we didn't rehearse shit. You know, we just, I said, Brett, let's go out there and have fun. And it was St. Louis. It was sold off. Remember, it was a TWA dome. That's another town that the WCW had a good house in before they killed. God, there were 20,000 people, me and Brett, right? How hard was that in St. Louis? You know what I mean? Yeah. Two well, names synonymous was, of wrestling in a wrestling town. There was town. so much potential in those days. And, no. you know, even with, like you're talking about that promo, I remember when all that place was buzzing and just totally... Totally lit up when you we and came I out. And worked like, for you come back to the dressing room and they don't do anything with you. You know, they just yeah. pass on you yeah. again the next week and come No, but I mean, you, you and I could have had a year long program, God forbid, that that Flair get a program with Bret Hart for a year. We could have wrestled for a year. I mean, or, we could have I mean, wrestled my whole time I was there. Yeah. Better than what they did. No, God forbid, you get next to me in WCW, you're done. <laughs> 
That well, was that was the way of the place. As a fan, I was glad that they booked you guys together because when when Brett was first brought in, it was uh, he was there at the end of the Starcade '97 main event. They tried to do a little takeoff of the Montreal incident, and Nick Patrick was supposed to do a fast counter. At least that was the plan, and then. You know, that didn't really go down exactly as they'd hoped. And Bischoff recently said he believes that Hogan put Nick Patrick up to doing a regular count. Brett, you were there ringside. What were you thinking when all this happened? And is that when you realized this is not going to be as fun as maybe you originally thought? Well, you know what? I'll be honest. I thought it was a pretty lousy finish in the first place. The whole thing was stupid and made little sense. Who was it seemed like a really Hogan and Sting. dumb idea Hogan and Sting? to bring oh, me in as a referee and out of nowhere. The whole thing was nonsensical. It didn't make any sense. But it was like, okay, well, Bischoff's supposed to be the genius and they're doing so great. You know, I got I to gotta just sort of listen to what they're telling me to do and do it the best I can. It was a lousy idea, and you can blame the referee all you want, but it is... It was a lousy idea, and the finish didn't work because he counted way too fast because he forgot that he had to count slow. And, uh, you know, it, it just sort of went downhill from there, where it was like, that was probably the highlight of my career there. So, you know, it, uh, <laughs> you know, it really didn't. I never thought, and I think Rick will tell you the same thing, is at least when you went to WWF, you knew what you were doing. You know, you, you really you got a clear stood. picture of what you're doing for the next while, and uh, you know how to how to put your input in and how to to make things better. They give you enough idea what you do in the next couple of weeks to sort of and who you were working with and what you needed to try to do as far as your storyline went. You know, with WCW, I don't think they knew shit. They never knew zero, and they, they couldn't lace Vince McMahon's shoes up. They they were so bad, they didn't know anything about anything. There was a bunch of little morons telling people what to do guys like kevin sullivan were giving finishes to guys like me and i just scratch my head and go what am i taking orders from kevin sullivan for like who the hell is kevin sullivan to be given you know i'm i think there's a big difference between vince mcmahon and you know vince at least when he hired guys to be agents and guys that would tell you what to do they were all top pros that had you know, years and years of experience. And uh, they were all good, like from Lanza to Chief J to, you know, Rene Goulet and uh, even Tony Gurria and those guys. They at least knew what a good match was. And they knew, you know, who had good heat. They knew how uh, the sound of the crowd and what the, you know, they could just tell you stuff that, you know, guys in WCW, I thought were really inferior. You know, to, and the, the whole experience there, I think, is they were on the verge of, unbelievable greatness and I can only imagine if they'd had some kind of you know leadership there you know someone that really did know what they were doing that company would be every bit as big as uh, WWE is today yeah direction uh, you know but in, and if that would be so much better for the, the wrestlers in the business because then there would be some kind of leverage where you could go from one company to the other or you could always be a threat to you know it's just like in Japan with all Japan and New Japan but all that benefits the wrestlers and uh you know, Eric Bischoff and all those uh, morons underneath him, they, they dropped the ball and uh, killed something that was going to be great for everybody. It should have been great for everybody. And it's too bad because there's guys in the industry like Rick and myself that, and uh, a lot of guys we've talked about in the last, uh, you know, last little while that made this business mean something back then and made people start getting interested in it and, uh, and start to follow. And it wasn't about the bodies. It was about the work in the ring and uh, the matches themselves. And if you look at, uh, you know, from the time that me and Rick were, I would say, in our prime in the 90s, um, they were going away from the bodies and the build, you know, the, the Hogan's and the Billy Graham superstars. It was about the it was about the work rate and the workers of the business. And uh, that's why they remember me and Rick today better than they remember... Um, I think the, the bodybuilders from 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 that era. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, without slapping each other on the back, it, you, you, if you could work, it's like, you know, there's never going to be another Ricky Steamboat. I mean, just it's just the way there is, you know. And uh, I don't know, you never met Wahoo, but I mean, there's some guys that I, I mean that, that stand out in my mind and guys that I got to work with, you know. And Brett, you're one of them too. I mean, and Sean, I mean Triple H. Um, I I I, did, I don't know. Did you ever get to wrestle Angle? No, I never got to work with Kurt. God, Kurt Kurt but Angle. I did get to know Wahoo. Yeah, you you had I to know Wahoo, Wahoo, right? Well. He was I never great. worked with Wahoo. You never worked with him? 
I only worked with him as a partner. Yeah. We tagged up over there. Yeah. yeah but he was uh, he was a, a tough uh, a tough guy and a, and a great uh, character too. Oh yeah, tremendous. I mean, he he just he's the one that got me, uh, you know, down in Charlotte and with George Scott and all that. So I mean, I'll, I'll ever be. I just brought it up the other day. I, I don't know why in the hell he's not in the Hall of Fame, but it certainly is something that oh. that should be. He's not even in the WWE Hall of Fame. Walter McDaniel's. That's hard to believe. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah he was such a um, he really was such a great great uh, worker and a great character in the business that. Uh, yeah, to know him was to love him. Yeah, and, and, uh, and yeah, your fans dad, and wrestlers always loved him. Yeah, your dad must have died for, uh, to, to know him because they, he was such an old school man. He he was a <laughs> him and Ray Stevens, man, two of a, two of, two of a kind. When I was in Japan, he uh, when we first got there, like you always, you know, you always get uh, get in the ring first thing with these Japanese guys, and suddenly you find out that. Uh, you should have done more cardio. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody, I remember every match, one after another, every American guy that went out came back with his tongue hanging down to his feet going, holy shit, these guys don't, they never stop. Yeah. And it's like, it takes a little while to get get used to it and, uh, you know, get your, get your cardio up for you and do, you know, give the Japanese back what they deserve. And, uh, <laughs> exactly. Wahoo, I remember the first two weeks or maybe three, it was a six week tour. We were there and he was, he was getting more depressed and mad with this going on and getting more fit. <laughs> you know, the first few days there, I remember he'd come back and see how, uh, how stiff they were <laughs> and how hard the matches were. But after about three weeks, I remember just Walt was just crazy on all of them. He, they were terrified of him. He was just going in there and just destroying them and not selling anything. He was yeah. chopping them to death. And yeah, he was. Every one of them. He didn't care who they were, it was Anoki or <laughs> Sakaguchi or whoever it was. They were all sorry they worked with him. <laughs> yeah. And it was like they started it and uh, he finished it. Yeah. Well, he had his hand was thicker than a two by four. I mean, and he had, that chop of his, man. Jesus. <laughs> Welcome to my first 10 years of my career. God, he was he used well, to beat Valentine half to death, Brett. I'm not lying. I don't, I don't. Did you ever see him work? Oh yeah, I saw him work. No, no, the two of them, Brett. I mean, Wahoo against Valentine. Oh no, I never did. The old no, man I never did. I saw. Oh, I saw. Uh, only never never met Johnny in person. Oh okay. Well, Johnny was there when I started. You know, he's in the plane crash with me. Um, but Wahoo used to beat John Valentine. You know, John. You know, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I'm I'm breaking into business and I'm traveling with Valentine and we're partners and all that. And he wouldn't, you know, if you if you went to throw him in the ropes, he, he wouldn't do it. He said, "Who can throw you in the ropes in real life?" And I go, "I don't know. I mean, that's I don't know. Well, why are you telling me this now? <laughs> we're partners. He said, well, don't let him throw you in the ropes." And I said, well, I got to throw him, throw him in. Nelson Royal is not going to understand me saying no to him, you know. So, <laughs> Valentine, you couldn't throw him. He wouldn't go rope to rope. <laughs> Did you know that? No, but it doesn't surprise me. No, he was like that, and he actually believed that. I mean, if, if you think about it, it, it makes sense, you know. Like, yeah. I say to everybody, now, how many, how, many, how many clotheslines can you duck? Right. In transition to get to another move, right? It got 87,000 clotheslines in three hours of Raw that have been ducked. If you're watching the show, <laughs> somebody figure out that they're going to duck under the clothesline, okay? Um, and some of the guys that can really work do it all the time. It's, you know, to, to transition into another move now, right, Brett? I don't think I ever no. said Brett ducked the clothesline in my life, and I know Brett didn't say it to me. You know what I mean? That was That's the most overrated thing in the world. But Valentine, he, he, Wahoo would beat him until he was, I mean, uh, unbelievable. And he would just fall over like a big tree. <laughs> <laughs> so hence, I, and I, I popped on that side. I said, well, I'm just going to add a few steps to that and walk out in the middle of the ring and do the same thing. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and take less of the beating. <laughs> yeah, John was great, but, man, he was a different kind of guy, Brett. You wouldn't have liked him, man. He just wanted to grab a front face lock on you like Dory, but hold it on you for about 45 minutes. Till the crowd started to itch. Either they were going to leave or they were going to get mad. It's time to go to school. Woo! Nation will return shortly. 
We're talking to big names in sports about their personal views on life and style on CBS Local Sports Player Style Files. This all-access show gives fans an in-depth personal view of their favorite players' lives. Watch online at cbslocalsports.com. This is is Woo Nation with Ric Flair. We've got Bret Hart with us on Woo Nation right here at Play.it. Brett, just recently the WWE has announced they're going to be releasing a disc on your brother Owen, and this has excited everybody online, but uh, maybe Martha has come out against it. Where do you stand on this? Do you think it's good that the WWE is finally doing a disc on Owen, or do you think that maybe they shouldn't have? Oh, I think they should should have a long time ago. I think that, uh, you know, Martha's got a very, you know, um, sour sort of viewpoint on on the, the industry and She's entitled to that, but I don't think it's fair to sort of um, bury his memory, you know, as a wrestler or try to, you know, see that no one ever watches his matches again. Or, you know, I think all of that's really childish and not very, you know, it doesn't have much, um, you know, it's, that's not going to do anybody any good. She should embrace the fans that love them and the wrestlers that worked with them that love them. And, and the whole memory of what a, he was, a, he wasn't a businessman or a, you know, or a, a car dealer. He was a professional wrestler, you know, and that's what he did for a living. And he made a living, a good living at that for a long time. And he grew up in the business and he, you know, was a sad, uh, a, you know, a tragic uh, ending for, you know, my family and everybody in it. But uh, it wasn't, um, you know, I don't think there's any reason to, to belabor the point really and just have bad, the bad old bad buzz about wrestling. And, you know, that we never, the business. the business was very good to us for a long time, and what happened with Owen was just a horrible accident. And uh, you know, Martha, you know, as sad as it is for the circumstances she she's in, uh, I think um, she's made more of an effort to see that Owen's never completely erased or that he's forgotten front by everybody. And I see that as a, a real uh, like to the logic of any of that. We've got Brett the Hitman Hart with us. You can check him out online at bretthart.com or on Twitter at Brett Hart. You're listening to Woo Nation with Ric Flair. And uh, you recently did a Twitter promotion where you ran the City Field account to promote an appearance there. And during that, someone asked your opinion of Hulk Hogan and he called him a dirt bag. Do you care to elaborate? Hey, I'm going to be at City Field with you. Let me hear about this. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't have anything to say about Hulk Hogan. Um, you know, I don't care to, you know, make a big go and a big rant about the guy either. I don't, uh, I just never found him very reliable with his, his integrity. And, uh, you know, I think I can say he's somebody that, uh, you know, made sure my career stopped and, uh, you know, that, that I never got any more. Um, I think whatever happened to WCW was directly, directly related to his, uh, instruction. And, uh, Bischoff was really just, uh, uh, Mark that was uh, playing uh, front man for, for Hogan and you know it took me a little while to sort of understand that and sort of hear from people that were behind the scenes and you know see how it was sort of designed for me to sit on the bench and not play a role in the show and I thought you know if you really look at you know the, the whole history side of it that I came in with uh, so much momentum and so much uh, it was like a godsend to, get to end up in WCW it was like so many guys that could have worked with so many storylines, including Hogan, that would have been great, great storylines. that could have done so many different things. And how uh, Hulk Hogan sat there and just crossed my name out with a pencil every day and, uh, until I, until my career was over. And uh, and to sort of look back on it now and go, like, that's okay. It's like, no, it's not okay. You know, he always pretended to be my friend. He's said a lot of questionable things about me. He's, um, a lot of questionable things himself, and uh, I just I don't have a lot of good things to say about him. And he's I've never been anyone that I thought was very honest. And that's about all I have to say about him. Well, Brett, let me just conclude this by saying, because um, um, you know, I'm just glad that you and I are friends. I love it when you text me, and I tell you something that made my whole weekend. Because it's not a lie, I've had a couple rough years out there, but. When you and I and Piper and those guys were doing that little thing with Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania, I walked over to you with your wife and you said, you look happy. You look good. 
And that rocked my whole weekend. I told Wendy you said that. I said, Brett looked at me and said, you look happy and look good. I am. For the first time yeah. in a long time. And I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for the text where you told me I looked like I was getting in shape. Thanks for following my career. <laughs> I hope to see you down the road. I'm going to see, I'll see you at City Field. We'll, we'll have a good time. Yeah, you know, I just, I'll just say, you know, I have a lot, I've always had a lot of respect for, for you and people that know me well enough know that uh, I've always um, respected, the, you know, everything you've done for me, you, you know, and everything from drop of the belt and how you treated me throughout my career anyway. You've always been uh, a stand-up guy for me and I think there's a lot of misunderstandings that sort of strained our relationship a few years yeah, ago. Yeah, that's just, we, that, you know, that's just people talking, you know what I mean? talking to each other, we sort of realized that there was a lot of smoke and no real fire and I never had any real issues and you never really issued that any issues with me. I think in in retrospect now, I look back on all my matches with you with a lot of pride. I had a lot of good fun and it was always fun working with you and it was never a, never a chore. It wasn't like going to Japan or anything like that. No. I loved my matches with you and uh, I wish we could have worked more. I wish they'd had more cameras in some of Well, you, you, came, you came with WCW, bro. You came with WCW, and they, they put you on the bench next in, to me. Uh, yeah, well, they, they put me on the bench, but, you know, the, the, some of the matches that I had with you and, uh, you know, I remember we had that Iron Man match. We had two shows that day. I think we worked Boston Garden, then we worked uh, Worcester, and then we did an Iron Man match, and it was just such a great match. And, uh, you know, I, I remember different nights, like in Germany, I spoke about them. We, you know, just tore the house down and had these, these phenomenal matches and uh, you know I miss them I, I, when I look back on great matches I, I have plenty of them with you but uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thrill being on your show here and uh, to, I appreciate the, the time I get when I see you and uh, Nancy when I'm down there or Wendy I mean <laughs> well, thanks for joining us on the show today. We appreciate you being on Woo Nation. This is the Woo Nation show with Ric Flair right here on Play.it. And don't forget, you can check out Bret Hart online at bretheart.com or on Twitter at Bret Hart. Bret, thanks for all the time. The best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. It was an honor, sir. All right. Take care, guys. Talk to you soon. All right. We're back on Woo Nation. Man, hell of a guest. Maybe the best one so far. Yeah. Well, you know, <clears throat> the best there is. The best, the best there was, was the, the best, best there, there ever, ever will be. be. Bret Hart, thank you, man. You're awesome. And I'm glad we're friends. It means the world to me. I don't know how we're going to top that. Woo! Oh, I think maybe I might have Batman on next week. about their personal views on life and style on CBS Local Sports Player Style Files. This all-access show gives fans an in-depth personal view of their favorite players' lives. Watch online at cbslocalsports.com.